professor? Yeah. So with your book, with this one on the hermeneutics or the good reading, yeah. does, do you, are you exploring like genre theory a lot? What's the relationship as you see it between something like hermeneutics and genre? Let me, answer, help? let me answer after the uh, after this uh, simple questions. Okay. Uh, okay. One and a half minutes. That guy seemed pretty old, right? The piano yeah. player. The piano player was, he was an older man. Yeah. Do you guys uh, hear it? Yeah, we're here. We're here, we're here, we're here. No, I don't hear the symphony though. Is the music playing? It's over. Are we early back or what? What were you asking me, Tom? I, I, I think, I, well, it's, I'm not even early, it's funny. But I, I think everything that I'm saying about reading and interpretation is, is kind of demonstrated in watching that, watching any great creator that's gonna be happening. Look at that older guy, right? How long is he, I think he put together, he won like a prize in 1950, right? He must, be, he must be 90, I don't know how old he was here. He's in 2014, I hope he's still alive. Anyway. You see that he's, throughout the performance, he's both listening very carefully to people around him, especially the conductor. I mean, it's just so, for me, so odd to see this 90-year-old guy looking up at this 55-year-old waiting for instructions. I mean, not only because of the age difference, but because this guy, Menachem Bressler, is one of the great piano players in the world. And yet still, he's looking up and responsive. There's always that part of being responsive. I mean, obviously, what I'm talking about now is more complicated. The role of a conductor in a an orchestra. It's a pretty strange or, I think, unique a role that a conductor plays. Because he's, I don't know, is he play, he's playing the orchestra. He's the one whose image of the symphony is being played, even though he's not playing it. Anyway, um, I think just a lot. A, Whenever you see creative people working, to see their, if you can watch and be, see the relationship to their craft, I think. Um, how do I do this again? In meetings, watch, oh, we're, we're, we're recording, okay. So, yeah, now we're clapping. Um, yeah, I couldn't hear the music. Uh, oh, I see, I'm sorry about that. Um, you know, it's like you're watching that Michael Jordan uh, uh, Netflix thing? Surely somebody here must be watching that, no? It's on his career? It's the only, like, it's like the only thing in America that has to do with sports that's actually happening. It's this 10 part um, documentary really on his, uh, I mean, it's on his playing career, yeah. Wow. 
but you know, you can learn that side of thing from athletes as well. You watch the way they relate to what's happening. The way, I mean, you just see the way Jordan sees sure. in an aggressive way, but also is completely aware of everybody else on, on the court. I mean, they're, they're, we see the bad, ver the bad version of the basketball players, like the bad version of the, the interpreter. Just jumping, you know, bad, I mean. Actually, I, I yeah. I'm a big MMA fan, right? It's like this fastest growing sport now in the world. It's quite new. But what's very fascinating about it is you have all of the traditional it's so It's so new, Tom. We don't know what MMA stands for. Uh, mixed martial arts. Ah. Tobia's really into that. Yeah, but I, I like it because it's even a metaphor. Like you see all the traditional cultural forms, right? You got the mutai or the various forms of grappling, etc. But then what really makes the notable fighters today are, is the mixed aspect. The one who are able to fuse and synthesize all the different traditional. So there's sort of, you see the pluralism of the different forms, but then it's the person who's able to the John Dunn or something of the fight. <laughs> I don't think it's a metaphor for the guy who has his nose broken though, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know what that would stand for in our... <laughs> anyway, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I think you see creativity and in, in any, in any, you see is that attitude of, of receptive engagement in any, in, for, in any context where people are being creative, I think, um, or great creators, including mm -hmm. sports. I'm sure there are exceptions, but to me, that's um, you see it, and especially in the way well, musicians. Professor, yeah, you did say that we have a responsibility to the text, to to adhere. Well, you have a responsibility to listen, don't you see? Don't you know what? Don't you want to know what I mean? That's what I'm saying. We can't just project. We can't just super impose our. There are criteria to creativity. I, I, I always feel very, um, I always feel very um, kind of dumb for saying, you know, whenever I talk about interpretation that in this manner that um, it's just exactly how we want people to relate to us. Like I said to you, see, do you understand what I'm saying? And we both understood at that moment that I wanted you to understand and you want me to understand. It may be imperfect, but C will interpret me in some way. So I think that's just, I think our, the, the interpretive, I just wonder, what, like, like to me, if you're not a good teacher, you're not a good reader. Because good teachers and good readers have to do the same thing. They have to be able to, to both, you know, speak and listen, do two things at once. If you can't do two things at once, you're not gonna be a good lecturer, maybe. You're not gonna be a good teacher, though. I don't know, so that's like my bumpkin reading of reading is like, I want to be treated like, I want, I want to be treated like I know people who I speak to want me to listen to them. I mean, Ben, you were talking about the fact, that, or somebody was saying, and, you know, those ideal speech situations, as some people call them, are, are rare. It's hard to find because of all the things we spoke about before. Um, hold on one second. Yeah. So, um, music, poetry. Shall, shall we do some Milton? So, why do Milton's why do Milton's angels eat? So let's, since we posed that as our question, and in the beginning we were speaking about the relationship between metaphysics and poetics. What greater text to look at than what we're looking at right? Now? So we meet Adam and Eve in book four, and then Raphael makes his way to paradise. Um, when, when Milton describes Raphael, what, what, um, what previous, what antecedents does he use? What generic lenses does he use for us to be able to see Raphael? Have we seen people in the classical world going from one, from one place to the next? from the heavens to the earth conveying a message? Hermes? Yeah, the FedEx, the, the FedEx of the ancient world, Hermes, right? Um, what's his name in-, in, um, in Mercury. Mercury. Mercury, right? So, um, 
when Milton imagines Raphael coming to Eden, he sees Raphael very much through classical lenses, Homer, um, Ovid, Virgil. Um, it really is, we've been talking before, that in order for us to imagine something, he has to give us something else in order that we can see it. So he comes down to heaven, to, to earth, and what is Eve doing at that point? Or what are they, I guess Adam sees him coming, and... They're gardening. Yeah, I guess they're gardening at the beginning, and then Raphael shows up, and then this meeting, which I guess in some ways is like Abraham in, in Genesis, right? When the angels come to eat at his house, so Abraham tells Sarah, go get some food ready. So Eve says to Adam, go get some food ready. Um, I thought it was that Adam says that to Eve. Yeah, I'm sorry if I misspoke. Yes, Adam says that to Eve. Um, so he addresses her um, and, and asks her, I guess, to get the food ready. I'm, I'm just not sure. We'll pick it up and figure out exactly where we are in, well, in the narrative. Well, yeah. Milton, Milton appropriates the Abrams to one, uh, one part of the Old Testament uh, to, onto another. Right. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, right? He's interesting, using, yeah. right. The Old Testament does that. He's, well, he's, well, yeah, but he's like a Bala Midrash, Milton. He's what, like saying, we, he's relating these two parts of the Bible together. Like why would we call that appropriation? What, what's, what's that? Why would we call that appropriation rather than just using one part to read another part? Right, no, right, right, right. No, but he's using both in the context of this Christian, in this Christian context, right? Um, um, so to, to whom thus Eve, earth's hallowed mold of God inspired. Who's talking to who here? Me and Marla me. Do you remember that from God? <laughs> Who's saying to who? Me and Marla me. You do that with Milton, right? To whom thus Eve? Eve is saying to Adam, Adam, earth's hallowed mold of God inspired small store will serve where store all seasons ripe for use hangs on the stalk. Save what by frugal storing firmness gains to nourish and superfluous moist consumes. But they're talking about they're talking about gardening here, right? Um, sorry. Mm -hmm. So that's, and then she goes off to cook. Yeah. She goes off to forage. They don't. They don't seem to have fire, if I remember. Right. right. It's they're having a cold buffet. <laughs> when, when salad does, bar. It's a salad bar. Yes. Um, Where, where do we pick up? Here's the angel talking here. Um, and then the angel shows up. Let's pick it up here, line 398. Hail, mother of mankind. That's how Raphael addresses Eve. Good start, right? Whose fruitful womb shall fill the world more numerous with thy sons than with these various fruits the trees of God have heaped this table. It's a very nice blessing, right? Raised of great grassy turf, their table was, and mossy seats head round, and on her ample square, from side to side, all autumn piled, though spring and autumn here danced hand in hand. A while discourse they hold, no fear, lest dinner cool, one thus began our author. I think that's the clearest example of a Miltonic joke. What's the joke here? A while discourse they hold, no fear lest dinner cool. Ho, 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 right? Adam and Eve are vegans, right? No fear that all they're eating is the stuff that they've gathered. So that's Milton's joke. They don't have to, no need to rush. When thus began our author. Our author being, again, we note the way in which Milton uses narrative terms to describe both Satan and Adam, and they represent different kinds of authorship. Uh, Heavenly stranger, pleased to taste the, those ba these bounties, which are nourisher from whom all perfect good on measure descends, to us for good food and for delight hath caused the earth to yield. Unsavory food, perhaps to spiritual natures, only this I know, that one celestial father gives to all. What's Adam's implicit question here? I'm from 400 to 402. 
but really 401 and 402. Can you eat? I'm not sure this is to your taste. But you right. I mean, I, I want to do what's the right thing here, meaning we want to do hachnaset orchim. We want to do a good, we want to do, we'll welcome you to our, our household, but we're really not sure what people, what you, people like you do. You know, we don't, we don't know your customs. What are you doing? And I mean, of, of, uh, he goes on, Adam, to, he's not sure of, of that, but he is sure of one thing. What is he sure of? Only this, it, I know. Sorry, see what? That it, that it, was, it originates from a God. Yeah, I, this, only this, I know that one celestial father gave to him. I mean, I'm not sure what's going on here, but I know God gave us everything. To whom the angel, therefore what he gives, whose praise be ever sung, Raphael is a gospel singer, right? Praise him to man in part spiritual. May of pure spirits be found no ungrateful food. And food alike those pure intelligential substances require, as doth your rational. Hmm. What, what, is, what is the short answer of the answer? And when, then what's the long answer? Short answer first. Your pure spirits become. Can they eat like the idea of the food? Does that make it? See, it's like not the food itself. It's like the the yeah, well, intellect. Like well, the, but, but, well, before you get to that, right now, you're, you're, that's the second. That's the second question. The second, oh, I sorry. Mean, no, but what's the but what's what's the first question? Is Adam says I don't know. Can you eat? And what's his answer? Kinda. <laughs> I mean, I think it's. I, we'll have to go on to your next question, and see exactly what Mil exactly how are these angels eating. I think the short answer really is yes, we do eat. And Milton is aware that angels don't eat. Why don't angels eat? What is they don't eat the physical sustenance. Of right. Food. I mean, so Re Renat is really coming from the perspective of the answer to this question, really meaning. Angels don't eat because they don't need physical sustenance. They're purely spiritual. Angels are purely spiritual and not physical, so naturally they don't eat. And the answer is, yeah, we do eat. To man, so to whom the angel, the, to whom the angel, therefore what he gives to man in part spiritual, may of pure spirits be found no ungrateful food. Can, can we go back and to well, okay, what and, does, Yeah. Yeah, what does um, to man in part spiritual mean? Let's go back to that in a minute. And food, can, yeah, professor, yeah. professor, can you interpret it for us? Can can we go line by line? I mean, we could. Please. Um, just, just like those. I want. Four so I, I I want. I just want to. You know what? I want to keep on reading to line four hundred and thirteen, and then we'll go back. Okay. Okay. Take a deep breath. It's all going to be okay. Now this is part of what we're talking. We're reading together. It's hard. Right, and, and I understand that that level of relaxed focus is very hard at the end of the day, not easy. Let's start again from the middle of 404. Therefore, what he gives, whose praise be ever sung to man in part spiritual, you realize it can mean two things. May of pure spirits be found no ungrateful food. May of pure spirits be found no ungrateful food. And food alike, those pure intelligential substances require, as doth your rational, and both contain within them every lower faculty of sense, whereby they hear, see, smell, touch, taste, tasting, concoct, digest, assimilate, and corporeal to incorporeal turn. So now after those 11 lines, we can really scratch our heads and say, what? Again, what's the short answer? Do angels eat? Apparently, yes. Apparently, yes. apparently so, right? Um, now, I only understood line 413. Okay, well, but we, we, get, we agree on that. Now, the first thing is, is that I think C.S. Lewis was a very conservative Christ, um, uh, commentator of, of Milton and conservative commentators will naturally be kind of dualists. 
they see the different, they distinguish between spirit and matter. They want to keep things separate. They don't like to get things messy. Um, so for Lewis, he has a very hard time with these eating angels. Well, it's even worse for Lewis that angels have sex and that he really can't abide, well, right? That's in the biblical so, canon. I, do ain't, that angels have sex is in the biblical canon? Yeah, 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 the Nephilim, yeah. the Nephilim. Yeah, the Nephilim. Okay. At the end of uh, okay, okay, okay. Not in the Not in the rabbinic canon, in the, in the biblical canon. And angels the are having sex. Of Genesis. Okay, okay, there you go. Um, but anyway, Lewis doesn't like this at all. Where does it say here that they have sex? Oh, no, that's in book eight. <laughs> Sorry, sure. We're saying You're that. eating right now. <laughs> right. First they, 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 I first was looking first. for the interesting bit. <laughs> right, we'll get there, right. <laughs> oh, well, you missed last week, Shuki. We talked about, you know, sex before and after the fall. That, that's also really interesting, right? Sublanut. <laughs> yeah, patient. <laughs> but right, to see Milton. So the first thing is, is there is something radical here going on. Now, before we get on to, like, wh why would, what could be radical about this? Why is it upsetting to other people to say angels eat? They're supposed to be oh, above uh, earthly. Yeah, okay, so, and, and, okay, so why, why, so you're breaking my assumption. Why is it that bad? a bunch of theological problems as well, though. What is a theological problem? That's what I'm asking you. I, I think it causes problems with understandings of things like communion to someone like C.S. Lewis. When you begin to understand that the spiritual will take part in the physical, then you don't have transubstantiation, you suddenly have consubstantiation. Whoa, and no, suddenly I, wait, he's wait, no longer wait, an wait, Anglican. Here, here, oh, wait, you got me. I just, got, I just went into like, uh, to C.S. Lewis hyperspace. I don't, I don't think I can necessarily follow everything you were saying there. Um, and, um, and I know I did bring up Lewis, um, but I, I just can't follow the intricacies of that right now. But I was thinking, and I was also thinking more in, in, sep, in 17th century terms. And in, I'm sure it's related to what you're saying, not to know. But in the 17th century, people care a lot about this. And I'm kind of wondering why somebody during this period would care. Like big, de like big deal, spirit, matter, big deal. What's, who cares? Why do I care? Right. Angels are divine, which means that they have to be above humanity. Okay, but why? But why? It creates a dependence. What's that? On food. It creates a dependence. Like on food, you need yeah. something in order to exist. So even, even, they're so not that. For even the angels, that it makes them human. But Donna, Donna, it says here that they make the corporal, they turn it into incorporal. So maybe yeah. they, they don't. Well, they look, don't but, look, but look at Goodsey, that's line 413. They, they, just this crazy line. And corporeal to incorporeal turn. I see why Natanel in a way is thinking about the Eucharist, because in a way that's what it sounds like, right? But for Milton, it's not, this is not, uh, this is angels eating what, whatever, and I don't know what he thinks this is a metaphor for. Do they it's need but, it's, the but, but it's, but it's, that's a very good question. Right? Because we could write, we could write, an, I, we could write an article about it. I don't know if Milton goes there. I don't know if he does. I know Adam passes gas. That's in, that's in, that's in um, post Edenic sex. That's what happens right afterwards. I mean, um, Milton is aware of the physical, both in the angelic. And the, and the man. Um, but I'm not sure, this is not a metaphor for the Eucharist. It sounds like the Eucharist, but angelic eating is a metaphor, I think, for something else. So we have to figure out what that is. But also this idea that the spirit and the material can come together is a controversial in any theological context. Meaning, and we talked about this a little last time, maybe some of you are familiar with the Jewish liturgy. And in the middle of morning and afternoon prayers, there's something called the Kedusha, right? The Kedusha mm -hmm. first asserts um, um, uh, Kadosh, 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 God, uh, <laughs> Holy, 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 the Lord of Hosts, right? Uh, mm -hmm. God, the God of Hosts. How does it continue? Mm -hmm. There you go, right. Kadosh, the, the world so that's is full like, of his glory. So, so that moment in the Kedusha, 
is like, that's been, right in that moment in the prayer, you get Spinoza. What do I mean by Spinoza? At that moment, God is, God is completely present to the world, right? Then, the Kedusha moves back. Right? I think like, but Baruch what? I'm in a different mode now. So what's the prayer mode? So after, what's the next thing after Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh? Right, so that's God fulfilling, completing space. What's the next verse that gets said? Right, so there, there, there God is mak, Makom. And it's, it's and it, Okay, so, but there now God is, we had that moment of fullness. Then God is kind of is pulling back, even though the word makom is still used, which is the name of the place. And then the next one is Hashem. A what is the next one? Right. Then, then the last part of the kedusha, we go from His presence to God pulling back, and then you go to the temporal, and the temporal completely moves away from the physical. So in the in the Jewish prayer, it's like there's a flirtation with God as part of the world, but then there's the pulling back, right? And then there's pulling back into the temporal realm. So Spinoza, that's how he actually imagines the world. That God, that the world is made out of God, or, the, or God and, or, or nature, or nature itself has implicit in it the divine. I don't know how Spinoza views the creation of the world. I told you Milton views the creation of the world as from God's body, as it were. Right? So even there, you see Milton's idea of the creation is continuity with the divine. He is created from God, not the Ishmael, not something from nothing, but it's, it's the creation as part of God, created from God. So that was threatening to people. So this looks a little bit like Spinoza. It looks like, and that's when people say, when critics talk about this, there are people who say Milton is a monist, that he believes in the identity between spirit and matter, and they'll point to this. And it has all sorts, if you say that, what, what does it mean for politics, let's say? The idea, is, are, is, there, some, is there a political consequence to metaphysics? What, or let, let me put it a different way. Why would a more conservative form of government, like you start to see at the beginning of the 18th century, prefer dualism to monism? I need to get more water. Think about it. Dualism to what? What was the second word? Somebody? Moni monism. Monism. Thank you. So monism ties the spirit and matter to together? Yeah. yeah. Monism is the idea is that matter is permeated with the spiritual, and dualism is the idea that the matter and the spiritual are separate. All right. I put the verses from Genesis in the chat if anyone wants them. Oh. Um, what was the question? Oh yeah, what's the, are there, what are the political consequences to metaphysics? Can we play the Jeopardy song? Does everybody, everybody understands my question? It's, I, mean, it's, I guess, not an easy question. It's not a hard question, but it's not an, it's not an easy answer. Okay, Tikva, go for it. Well, if you believe in monism, then yeah. the, um, how do you say hashlachot? The repercussions? Know. The repercussions yeah. of that. Consequences. Thank you, consequences. <laughs> the consequences of that would be uh, believing that all people are permitted or contain of the spiritual slash divine okay, and then you would have to course. treat them all well which is a terrible idea um, um so that because the spirit is now permeating the material because now there is no distinction between if matter is no longer dead and if matter is no longer dead well it's alive and the hierarchies, the metaphysical hierarchies that the 18th century is going to really want require that kind of distinction between spirit. These things have to be separated, especially because not only what Tikva is saying, people, if they are inspirited and partly divine, they want to rule themselves. That's the big reason, right? 
kings yeah, want dual kings want dualism revolutionaries want monism because they want to aren't feel kings that going to be heretics pardon aren't kings don't kings also become heretics under this uh, from this I, why would, would why would charles become a heretic because of this because the moment that you begin to insist on right. your ability your divine right to rule over other divine right. spirits right confused. well kingship is always going to be like or that i understand what you're saying Right, well, so kingship is going to prevent the realization of the divine nature of all people, right? So that's, that's what's at stake here, right? It's not only metaphysical, it's really, uh, it's big part is really political, about how are you going to organize society. And this gives license to the radicals of the 17th century. And in the 18th century, there's a big pull away from it. So that's one reason people are concerned about it. I mean, it's, I think, a primary reason. And it also, I mean, it also may lead to atheism, because once you, once you say the world is divine, then why do you really need God at all? Right? I, 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 I sent that YouTube video of Shirley MacLaine on the beach saying, I am God. No? You know who Shirley MacLaine is? Kind of like mediocre actress from, I mean, maybe she was good at some point, 70s and 80s. Anyway, so she's, in, she's in terms of endearment. In terms of endearment, there you go. That is a movie that's almost impossible to sit through, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, right? I mean, I bet, any, I, bet, I bet it would be almost impossible for anybody in this classroom to sit through that entire movie. Well, I, I wouldn't go you, that far. You liked it? I didn't love it, but it's not like I <laughs> no, it's, it's just stood for the exit. No, but it's just so emotionally attached to a certain kind of 80s way of being in the world or whatever it was. Mm. I just think it's, it's far from my emotional register now, but um, I understand that it's subjective. Oh, oh. Um, so, um, right, so you, but so that, that, that cut of her in this very bad TV movie saying, I am God, is like a very perverted notion of Spinoza, meaning I'm now the divine. I myself am the divine. It, it saturates certain kinds of neo, neo what culture in America? Neo, I can, I don't know. Neo paganism? Spiritualism? Yeah, I don't know. Oh, new age, new age. Oh, new yeah. age, right, yeah. right. You are God, I am God. Ah, <laughs> oh, the pantheism, pantheism. We're all, yeah. we're, we're all God, right? Oh yeah, and you mentioned that thing about Spinoza and the pineal gland. All right, yeah. And a lot of this new age stuff with ayahuasca becoming popular, it's understood that it activates the pineal gland. Listen, uh, Tom, this is, a, this is a class that's gonna be put online for children. I'm kidding. What, What's the pineal what gland? It? Yeah. It's Horus's eye in our brain. It's like the third eye of Hinduism. Wait, and wait, some people chill out, okay? Tom, I'm, you can't do it. Don't go there yet, okay? Um, so first, so um, <laughs> another thing that's, pro this issue is so problematic. The relationship between spirit and body, right? Mind and body. It's so problematic because you come out either on one of two sides. Either one, you're Spinoza and you become an atheist because nature is God. Or two, you're, a, you're Hobbes because there is no God, right? Spino Hobbes' world is a world without God and man is almost a completely material mechanical being. That's really how Hobbes speaks of man as, really, as a mechanism very beginning, the introduction. And Spinoza uh, seems to articulate this kind of, a, a version of selfhood and politics and ethics based upon um, monism, pantheism. So you're stuck with these, you, you're, they're two impossible choices. That, and, and that's one problem. And then Descartes has another problem. Descartes is the dualist and he says, mind and body are separate, but he wants to find a way of showing that there's some connection between the two. He doesn't want to turn into Spinoza by saying they're identical, and he doesn't want to turn into Hobbes by saying they're completely separate. So he's got to find some way of saying the spirit, whatever the spiritual, the soul, is resident in the body. So he says, and I don't know if it's a philosophical joke or not, he says, <laughs> that that mediating point is the pineal gland inside the brain. And by that, what he's trying to do is just solve this philosophical problem. 
meaning he's trying to find a way to make sure that the world does not separate into separate realms of mind and body, whatever, Descartes and the pineal gland, right? Here it looks just ridiculous, right? It's like a mathematical equation. Where exactly is the pineal gland? To the extent that people do that from Descartes' perspective, it is a joke, right? You don't find it someplace. It's some way in which Descartes is trying to guarantee the relationship between mind and body, matter and body. Milton does it also, but Milton does it through what he calls right reason. A man is made in the image of God, and the image of God for man is reason used in a certain way. Anyway, so going back to our issue, Milton is, finds himself in the middle of this like metaphysical mess, right? There are the Car Cartesian dualists, and those are, the, those are the orthodox good guys. Then there are the Hobbesians, and that's the absolute worst guys. They're, they're the worst ever, right? Because they're atheists. And then there's Spinoza, and he's almost as bad as Hobbes. And then Milton kind of is, where, where one of the things we're gonna ask is, well, how does Milton fit into all of this? He does seem to be a monist here. Can we go back to the poem? Yes, you wanna stop at some point? You wanna interrupt me? You wanna smoke a cigarette? No? So Milton yeah. is a, seems like, the like uh, this Descartes, Descartes? No, we, we're, we're gonna just use, we're gonna use those categories to think about Milton. I mean, here it seems that Milton is breaking down that Cartesian distinction. This is the other lecture that I gave, which you should probably watch. Just like in Dunn, in the canonization, spirit and matter come together, right? In the middle of the poem, right? You think of sex and God at the same time. Dr. Johnson freaks out about it, right? So also Milton is breaking down these distinctions. But my, but angels eating is a breaking down of those traditional distinctions. Angels shouldn't eat. And Milton makes a point of it and says, I know they're eating. And that I'm doing it on purpose. Where are you guys, you're still there? I just lost you. Whoa, 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 what should happen here? Does, yeah, go ahead. Let's not create a problem though inevitably in that at some point every disagreement suddenly becomes a, a theological crisis in the aspects of the divine are disagreeing with each other. Who, where, what are we talking about now? That there's the, between these different perspectives that I just mentioned? No, with, with, within the monist perspective. Yeah, that. Every time that two people disagree in politics, you suddenly have aspects of the divine arguing with each other. Elo velo de velo kim is that the answer that, that, that the monist gives? Is that? I don't know. I mean, I think that's, we know that Milton and Ariapagitica thinks difference is a good thing and mm. that people can argue different perspectives and disagree and all still be right. And maybe, so nothing else says, well, maybe the metaphysics, I mean, you're, what you're really saying, I think is that argument, the Spinozan argument pushed to its, extreme, it's not, so nothing I was not saying what I responded to. So that was an argument pushed to an extreme really doesn't allow, it kind of gets you back into the Hobbesian position because everybody's speaking out of God's name or something. You have to read Spinoza's Politics and Ethics to see how that works. I don't know. Um, but that's not Milton. That's not Milton. Because be Milton, that, pardon? Could it be that Milton is going along the lines of um, St. Augustine? Um, not th that's his name, right? The Confessions dude, his name is Augustine? The Confessions dude is Augustine, yeah. Okay, um, so he talks about this metaphor of, of us being a sponge, um, yeah. a, a sponge uh, in, uh, in an ocean, and in that case, yeah. we cannot, we are floating in the ocean, we cannot- you guys, I, want, I, just, I just want, I want to interrupt you because um, what's happening now in the 17th century, and this is what's different, is that Milton is still using both metaphors like Augustine, but he's also using a language that's not only from the Old Testament and the New Testament, but also he's aware of certain kind of scientific dichotomies. Milton is writing to, and he's not writing to philosophers, but he's writing in relationship to philosophers. He knows what's going on. He knows that there are arguments among philosophers about this point. 
Now he is coming into it as a poet, you're right there. But his metaphors are very much dependent upon the contemporary metaphors. Let's go back to the poem for a minute, okay? Because I do wanna look at more of this. Um, May a pure spirit be found, no ungrateful food. Oh, let's go here because we wanted to know what in part means. Therefore, what he gives to man in part, so that either qualifies what he gives or to man in part spiritual, that man is in part spiritual, so it goes both ways. May of pure spirits be found, no ungrateful food. Whatever man gets, which itself has some kind of spiritual element, is also good for us. We're also grateful for it. And food are like those pure intelligential substances require as doth your ration. And food are like those pure, I think us, intelligential substances. How would a philosopher look at that term, intelligential substances? An oxymoron? That makes sense, right? Hobbes goes off, this, I think, um, some, Hobbes goes off for like 15 pages on incorporeal substance. Not possible. They don't exist. They don't come together. So Milton is using this term. Why, why is it an oxymoron? Deep breath. Why, why is oxymoron? Because he's mixing the intelligible, the non-physical with the physical. So even just that very metaphor in relationship to the angels is showing that there is a, there is a cont continuity and again, it's not a continuity only in the angelic world. Milton is saying something about the world itself, that it's built according on some level to continuity. And both within them, both men and angels, within them, both contain within them every lower faculty of sense. Sense. Angels have sense. Whereby they hear, see, smell, touch, taste, concoct. That's an alchemical term when you take the spiritual out of the physical, digest, process, assimilate, another word from process, and corporeal to incorporeal term. That's what angels do. So here, Milton is emphasizing the importance of what he's looking, his metaphysics are based upon continuity, and here, here at least continuity and not distinction, right? Um, and do we miss the- Could you explain the continuity bit? Um, let's continue and I'll, we'll continue on that. Um, I, I just love Milton. Um, here we go. So, so what, what do I mean by, what do I mean by the continuity between the physical and the spiritual? Can somebody help me here? You ask the question, uh, but you don't get to answer. It would seem to imply they're not of separate kinds in the way that dualism posits, right? Like it's a spectral continuum. So, and, and he says in there, I forget which verse, but the idea that the higher up you are, you contain everything underneath, like of the lower. Right, right. It also may mean that man, I think Milton says this here, Raphael says this here, that he can aspire upwards. It's like a ladder. Right, so think about that from political terms, right? If you're, if you're a royalist, you want to kill that as quickly as you can, right? This idea not only of holiness, but a kind of aspirational holiness, that doesn't work, right? Um, so here, so down they sat, here the angels are sitting down to eat, and Milton is hitting you over that. So down they sat, and to their viands fell, nor seemingly the angel, nor in mist the common gloss of theologians. Milton is pointing out how contemporaries deal with angels eating in the Bible. What do they say? I don't have the anchor Christian Bible. What, what apparently do they say? The angels aren't really eating. They're like clouded in some kind of mist or something and we don't know or it looks like they're eating or there's some kind of magic trick. What do, what do the rabbis say? It's angel food cake. 
What, what? Angel for Kids. No, oh, it was a joke that existed, but should not have been said. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, they say that the angels only pretended to eat. All right. So the, rabbi, so the rabbis also have a problem with this, right? They, I'm angels, sure there's other rabbis that say. Oh, okay, good, good. But the, so that rabbinic strand says the angels don't eat because you, they don't want to get into that. They don't want to get into that trouble. Same thing. Um, so so they down and sat down and to their viands fell, nor seemingly the angel, nor in mist the common gloss of theologians, but with keen dispatch of real hunger. They're really hungry. And concoctive heat, again, that alchemical met metaphor, right? so to concoct something, to, to, to burn it up so you see it most purely. And concoctive heat to transubstantiate. What does that mean? So Natan, I cut Natanalo off before when he mentioned transubstantiation and consubstantiation. So I probably shouldn't have done that. What is transubstantiation? Uh, the transformation of the, the Eucharistic hosts into the body of Christ and the wine to the blood of Christ. Right? Yeah. yeah. Right. Here it's a metaphor. That's what's cool here, right? It's not a metaphor for what happens in the Eucharist. I don't know how Christian, Christians, I think Catholics don't look at it as a metaphor. Protestants probably do look at it as more of a metaphor. No, not so much. Uh, it's yeah, a discussion. Kinda. That's what you were saying before. Now. It's a discussion. Um, but here it is definitely being used as a metaphor, uh, but with, for their eating, or maybe something else as well. And contactive he to, trans, to transubstantiate what redounds, I don't know what that means, transpires through spirits with ease. What does that mean? Nor redounds what transpires? Oh, yeah. Here's Shuki's question. Having argued that angels may eat earthly food with real hunger and real digestion, Milton feels bound to account for the waste products of digestion. What redounds? <laughs> right? So angel... Can you imagine little angel toilets? Right? Didn't he explain that bit earlier when he said that they turned the corpeal into the incorpeal? So I thought yeah. part of the digestion yeah. process was Too that they make nope. the food spiritual? What do they do? What do they do up there above? They corporeal to incorporeal turn, right? Right. I thought that there wasn't so much a waste process so much as turning the food into the spiritual. No, no, there's still waste. And Milton says, you know, whatever. It's Milton science fiction. You know, he gets to decide. It's, you know. Um, is that where we are? I know we went down further. Yeah. And here he uses these alchemical metaphors. Why is, why do we, why is alchemy, and we already know a lot about alchemy because we've seen it in Dunn, we've seen it a little bit in Milton. Why is it a good metaphor for him? What do alchemists presuppose? What do they assume? What, where do they fit into this argument about spirit and matter? Because matter can be turned into, uh, yeah. into something spiritual or, or non higher. physical. Right. It can it can higher. be it can be converted from its state of of physicality into something else. They're, from the base to the yeah. they're material monists. They believe that all material is one. So like within the lead, the lead has the experience of being gold. And if you right. do something to it, it can remember being gold and become gold. Or the alchemist has certain powers. And, uh, it's, and I mentioned to you that Newton was an, not, so Milton Newton is at the end of the tradition that starts with Dunn and goes through Milton, because Newton starts out for 20 years being an alchemist. Because, mm -hmm. and, and that means a certain view of metaphysics. And then what happens? The irony is then he becomes the, the point for, un, for, the mo, for modern dualism, more than Descartes. But Meaning, didn't, the, didn't the alchemist understand that if you can turn anything into gold, then gold becomes worthless? I, I don't, they have to read Johnson's Volpone on that. So <laughs> that's that's whatever. Alchemist. But you see that what's interesting is that Newton is part of both of these traditions. I mean, he's the end of a poetic tradition. And then when he writes, I mean, I don't know how it happens in his brain, but he does become the point person. When anybody wants to argue against radical metaphysics, we've already described that, they point to Newton. And Newton is looked at as a kind of savior.
for doing this, for saving the universe for a certain kind of political orthodoxy. Um, so it's just weird that Newton is both the end of one tradition and the beginning of another one because he uses these alchemical metaphors, which assume, as you've been saying, a continuity here. And that's why Milton likes it here, because alchemists- and, a savior? Because he, I'll give a lecture on it at some point, because he allowed, he, he provides a metaphor which allows people to believe in dualism, which is not atheistic, whatever, okay? Um, so alchemists and angels are doing similar things. They're converting, the physical into the spiritual, right? I mean, it makes sense that he's using the metaphor. And let's see what he says. No wonder if by fire of sooty coal, the empiric alchemist can hurt, can turn, I love this part, or holds it possible to turn metals of drossiest ore to perfect gold as from the mine. So the, the, the comparison of the angel to the alchemist, but this, this clause here just stands out, right? Or holds it possible to turn? Can the alchemist do it or can he do it? Now, I don't know, can he, I, don't, I don't know why he's casting doubt on the angelic process, but we'll come back to this in a minute when he uses the metaphor again. Um, but we see that this continuity between the physical and the spiritual, and it's demonstrated through the, the angels that like this, you can almost understand them like in a sci-fi movie. They take like, they take the spiritual and they turn it into, you know, into oil and they save the universe. Right? I mean, you can imagine something like that. In fact, there was a movie just recently like that about the moon. Did you see that movie where one guy plays two people? It's about the, so this mission and the, there's one, there's a corporation, they harvest the moon for energy. They harvest the sunlight of the moon for energy. Not a terrible movie. It's the sunlight of the moon. The, ba the dark side of the moon. They're, they're, that's the, the metaphor in the movie. They're harvesting the, the sunlight from the dark side of the moon. So they're taking the spiritual, as it were, that's a sci-fi version of, the, of what's happened here, and turning it into the physical. Well, why does he qualify the but holds to, like the alchemist believes? I don't can... know. I'm going to come back to that. We're going to come back to that. First, we're going to read. So, so, uh, so um, Adam asks Raphael, what's up with the eating? Right? I don't get it. Right? And then, the, and then Adam answers, to whom the winged hierarch replied, oh, Adam, one almighty is from whom all things proceed and up to him return. If not, if not depraved from good, created all, such true perfection one first matter all. So God is, man is here, and here you see these, Milton's explicit monism. All things proceed, from whom all things proceed, everything comes from God. Created all such to perfection, one first matter all. Let's see how the editor wants to explain that for us. The entire universe, including man, beast, earth, and angels, all originated from the one first matter of God himself. And here he uses spectrum, continuum, exactly as we've been saying. Endued with various forms, various degrees of substance. I had a teacher at it when I was in, in graduate school, and she would point it out to me. The, ma the, the monism here is qualified by dualism. Degrees are language, one first matter all is language of non-differentiation. Degrees is matter of differentiation, right? So Milton, I think not surprisingly, cannot, under, cannot be understood as being either a pure monist or a dualist. We'll have to see why, but here at least we have the facts. He's insisting on some differentiation. One first matter all endued with various forms, various degrees of substance, and in things that live of life, but more refined, more spiritous and pure, as nearer to him placed or tending. Interesting that there are some who are placed closer to God, and that implies an old world of hierarchy, 
and then there are some who are nearer tending. Those are the, those are those who aspire. Just like so, what are, if if angels convert the spiritual, the the the, uh, the physical into the spiritual? What do what do people do? What was the question? Spiritual, physical. Wait, wait a second. So angels, what do they do? So they eat, and what do they do when they eat? I guess they go down and they use the physical food, and they, and they eat it and are sustained by it. So their bodily, their bodies, as it were, are sustained by eating. I'm just wondering, what, what, are, what in this activity? Let's see. Maybe Milton is going to be a little bit more explicit. I'm just wondering what the direction is for man and how the incorporeal and corporeal are related. Angels go down to sustain themselves. And Milton here says men go up. I just want to know how do men, get, how do men go up in this, this world? Um, but more refined, more spiritual and pure, as nearer to him placed or tending, each in their several active spheres assigned. You see again how Milton, and this is, this is where I argue with, critics who care about these things, that Milton is not a pure monist because he's insisting, even in this idea of continuity and identity, on, on things being placed in spheres assigned. So the world of Spinoza is a, an entirely mobile world. Everything is moving around, right? In Milton's world, there's a possibility of moving up but there still is some order. Right? Some people are closer to God, either because they were placed there from the beginning or because they're moving on up, right? Um, each in their active sphere is assigned to the body up to spirit work in bounds proportioned to each kind. Right? Again, continuity and dissimilarity. It's a same, it's, we see it throughout Milton's work. I want, I want to come, let's just go a little further because ultimately I want to talk about the relationship between this and how Milton sees his, the, the, the problem of, we talked about the relationship between metaphysics and politics. I want to talk about the relationship between metaphysics and poetry. And I want to get there, okay? Uh, so here's this metaphor. And if you were undergraduates, I would ask somebody to come up and draw this tree on the board and somebody would try and fail, right? Uh, Milton draws this little tree of the cosmos. So, for, I mean, it's, it's interesting to see how people fail. Some of the failures are very good. And that might say, that might be what representation is in general, the good failures. So from the roots springs lighter the green stalk, from thence the leaves more airy, lest the bright consummate flat, last the bright consummate flower, spirits odorous breathe. Flowers and their fruit man's nourishment, by gradual scale sublimed to vital spirits aspire, to animal, to intellectual, give life, both life and sense, fancy and understanding, whence the soul reason receives, and reason is her being, discursive or intuitive, discursive is office, yours, the latter most is ours, differing in degree, but of kind the same. Wow, that was just incredible, no? This is like, this is, this is the, the cosmos according to Milton. So where does it start? The tree, the tree this is the tree. So where do we go? So we, so we start with what part of the tree? From the tree to the animal to the Let's man. start with, right. So from the tree to animal to man and then different parts of the ration. So let's do the tree first. Root, right? Mm -hmm. The root, the green yeah. stalk, the leaves, more airy. Even the physical things are becoming more airy. Last, the bright consummate flower, spirits, odorous, breathes. This is the part where undergraduates have to be creative when they're drawing, right? You have to be able to represent the non-representable, -represent these odorous spirits, right? They're non-physical. Flowers, and their fruit. So now we transition from that vegetable world to, as you said, the next one is man's nourishment. So man takes these vegetable things and he, he takes the physical 
or the physical exists in man in such a way that he sublimes it somehow, that's the metaphor Milton uses, into the spiritual. So to, it goes from animal spirits, oh sorry, by um, flower, flowers and their fruit, man's nourishment, by gradual scale sublime, to vital ear, spirits aspire, I guess vital becomes comes before animal. Vital spirits aspire to animal, to intellectual, give both life and sense. So now we're, we're very much in, we're in the intellectual, but still sense is part of the intellect. Fancy, imagination, and understanding. From both of them, whence the soul reason receives, and reason is your being, discursive or intuitive, discourse of oft is yours, the latter most is ours, different but in degree of kind the same. So it like goes up eventually, fancy understanding, the soul, the soul is defined by reason. Um, so you see this kind of, this, this moving up through the physical world. It's like there's, somebody used the metaphor of the ladder, but it's, it's, there are no steps. You're kind of just like aspiring up it. You're subliming yourself up it. You're slowly becoming less physical and more spiritual. And then that last part, I don't know if we can answer that. Why, why are, what, what's the difference between a discursive and an intuitive intelligence? The latter most is yours, is ours, differing but in degree of kind the same. This is the angel speaking to, to Raphael. Rangel, angels intuit, Rafi, uh, and people use discourse. Why is that? What is it, why, did, why, does, why does Milton's Raphael want to say that it's angel, angels have different way of understanding the world? They intuit it, but we use discourse. What's he saying? What's the difference between angels and people? Like we have to interpret, but they experience more directly. Well, I think it's, it's it's almost like the difference between something like affective, you just understand it intuitively, and interpretive. So the angels have a more unmediated, intuitive relationship to, to the world. But but people, it, it, men and angels are different, in that angels need different that men need difference to understand. That makes sense? We need language, we need difference to understand. You see how Cole Milton's brain is here, right? So angels see things intuitively. Language? How does language relate to difference? Um, because language, first of all, language assumes the difference between what it's representing and what it, what, and between, there's a, because there's a separation between the signified, the image, and what it represents. It's not, it is, it is not the thing itself. It needs to be interpreted. The state, and that is, that's going back to what I was saying, the first part of our talk today, or the seminar, is that that's what scientists don't want to accept. That the, that, that, that the world is always interpreted. Only angels intuit the world. We, man uses language. It's different, I know there are different kinds of languages. Um, but discourse, so discourse is off. This here's the latter most, this hour is differing, but in degree of kind the same. Um, but maybe I'm actually checking my notes. It looks like a line 564. So then Raphael, I think Adam asked him another hard question. So, I mean, I, I don't know if it's too, too obvious to point out that um, Raphael's the poet here, right? And Adam is us, the reader. And Adam's asking the poet, like, can you help me out here? I need to understand this stuff. So Raphael says, I'll do my best. And Adam made, thus Adam made request 360, 561. After a short, short pause assenting, thus began, high matter thou enjoinst me, O prime of men, sad task and hard for how shall i relate to human sense the invisible exploits of warring spirits 
What's what's Raphael asking here? How can I understand the the civil war in heaven? Oh, is is that the question he gets asked? Right. Uh, but let's let's speak it more. I mean, the civil war in heaven. Um, okay, the invisible. What's it about the war in heaven that's so difficult to represent? I mean, why, why is Raphael, as this, at, I'll, in a second, Renaud, yeah? Why is Raphael the, um, and I think he's a kind of figure of the poet, why is he worried? What, what's he worried about? Renaud, yeah? It seems like he's trying, he's grappling with the, how do you articulate something that you can't articulate? Uh, right. I it's think like that, trying to tell, it's like right. trying to tell a blind man what the color blue is. Uh, right. So it's not only the specificity of this particular war in heaven, it's how can I relate what's fundamentally unexpressible? It's ineffable. It can't, it, I mean, here I think that Raphael here is, is, um, is dramatizing the problem of theodicy. <laughs> That is, what, the, what is a poet to do? Oh, prime of mad sad task in heart, for how shall I relate to human sense the invisible exploits of warring spirits? How without remorse the ruin of some so many glorious ones stood, and perfect while they stood? How last unfold the secrets of another world, perhaps not lawful to reveal? What's, what's, what's the poet's worry here? It's not, it's not permissible to, uh, to narrate, to... Mm. Right, maybe, maybe right. And this is not only the misgivings of a classical poet saying, I don't know if I'm representing the muse properly. This is a misgiving of a Christian poet saying, I'm risking a lot by doing this because I might be getting it wrong. So, what, so then the question would be is, well, dude, why do it then? If this represents such a big risk, which in a way it does, why risk it? Just give me a second here before you answer. I'm just looking for another quote. Um, Yeah, so um, why does he do it? What's the next part of the line? It's for your own good. I, yeah, even, so if I, I, even if I mess up, it's still better than nothing, I guess. Right, so I think you hear C. Milton representing his own sense of the imperative of writing. I must do this. I know there are dangers in this. I know there are dangers in representation. See, I'm taking Milton at his word. I'm taking it as Milton that, he's really, that he really feels both the anxiety and the obligation. Yet for thy good, this is just dispensed. And what surmounts the reach of human sense, I shall delineate so by likening spiritual to corporeal forms as may express them best. Now we're really confused, right? Because the same language that Milton used here, he used before with the angels and Eden. Do, doesn't this answer your question about, about how it is that man ascends? Like we know how the angels descend, but it's mm. with our reason, our rational faculty to make things intelligible that mm. we ascend. Mm. So this writing endeavor would seem to be accomplishing that. Well, th that's the risk that he's taking. He's, he's giving, uh, he's, he's using images, which might be misleading because he feels this obligation to teach. Because, on, and I think part of it is also because this is, well, let me pull back a second. What's the relationship between angelic eating and what poets do? 
and what surmounts the reach of human sense, I shall delineate so by liking spiritual corporeal forms, as may express them best. The best he can. He does the best he can. I mean, in a way, he's reversing the process of the angels, right? The mm -hmm. angels go up. Sorry. The angels use the material to nourish themselves. So here, what is the poet doing? He's taking the spiritual, that's what he claims he's doing, right? And he's putting it in physical form. I shall delineate so by likening spiritual to corporeal forms, as may express them best. So how is Milton confident about representation here? I mean, how, when you read this passage here, how is, what is Milton's attitude towards what he's doing? He's got doubts about it. He might even have fears about it. He's going on and he's going to do it anyway. He does it relu reluctantly. He does it reluctantly. And, what's, and what, does, what, what is the goal here? What surmounts the reach of human sense, I shall delineate so. By likening spiritual to corporeal forms, what are, what are corporeal forms here? What are the, the corporeal forms? The images, the po images. Poetry, right? As, as, as may express them best. Does that show that he has confidence in what he's doing? I mean, yes and no, right? I mean, I'm doing my best here. I guess that's what you said. As may express them best. Though, these last three lines always perplex me. Though what if earth be but the shadow in heaven and things therein each to other like more than on earth is thought? Weird here, right? He starts out by saying, I'm going to do my best to use representation. And the qualifier is not saying, you know, I'm not sure if representation really works. The qualifier is the what if earth be but the shadow of heaven, which still implies difference, but then he goes full force for similarity. And things therein each to other like more than on earth is thought. Meaning, strangely, and I just don't know, I don't, get the, I don't get the force of the what if here. Isn't the what if a better, isn't that a better scenario? Meaning, my assumption is earth and heaven are different. And I need to use my discursive intelligence because People use um, um, metaphors and language, and angels use um, their intuition. Yeah, the what if is a better? He's uh, asking, yeah, what if it is a, it is a, there are more similarities. Okay, yeah, oh, so it's interesting. There's a kind of like, there's, so what does that mean? That maybe, maybe, the, maybe my poetry is doing better work than I thought it was? Maybe poetry has more of a, I'm just wondering, what is it saying about the possibilities of poetry here? That it's the nourishment of the soul, right? That sounds good. Where do you get that? So it's the nourishment of the soul, right? Poetry well, yeah, because we talked exactly. about the nourishment of the body with eating. So that's now. exactly right. So poetry is the it's the way the the body nur it's the way man nourishes himself. And what verse is that? You just said it. I don't know. No, but the one we ended on. Um, I got I lost track. In oh, I shall delineate it so by likening spiritual to corporeal firm as may express the best of what, what if earth be but the shadow of heaven, here Milton is asserting even more similarity and things there in each to other like more than on earth is thought. Um, so I want to look at just one more image, it's late. So in book six, Milton comes back to this image, I think, um, where he comes back to the alchemist, I think. And with this, we'll just finish up, I think, 651. As I said, we're really focused much more today on answering this question, so we're skipping ahead here. Um, six, five, ten. Okay, so where are we? So this is in book six, 
and the book six is the war of heaven. And one of the ways that Satan understands the war of heaven, it's our last point for the evening. One of the ways that says Satan understands the law, the war of heaven is that it's a narrative uh, contest, right? Who's going to, we, we talked about this before, this idea of Satan telling a story that is equivalent with the story of God. So he speaks a lot about author, authorship and narration. And later down here, there are these really bad puns about incentive reads. And um, I mean, Satan imagining his own story or his own warlike efforts in terms of song. I don't want to get distracted by them now. I just want to go back to another alchemical metaphor. In book five, we saw the alchemical metaphor, I think, as a metaphor for interpretation, right? From, or you say, from, incorporeal, from incorporeal to corporeal turning, that's what the poet does, and the reader from incorporeal to corporeal turning. They're both involved in this relationship. They come together. And that's used, and that's where we saw this, um, the, the use of the alchemical metaphor. Here's another one. Here, it's in relationship not to what happens between Raphael and Adam, but Satan and his version of narrative. What, I'm, I, what I think we'll look for here is how is Satan's version of poetry different from that that we see Raphael telling Adam? And, and how do we see that from the difference of the alchemical metaphor? So here it starts. Um, in a moment, up they turned wide the celestial soil. So they're digging. Um, I guess here in, in book one, they dig palate, they, they make the, the, the castle, the palace in hell. Here in book one, they're digging up heaven, I think. In a moment, in book six, they're digging up heaven, all right? For looking up for gunpowder or whatever, I don't know. In, in a moment, up they turned wide the celestial soil and saw beneath the originals of nature in their crude conception, sulfurous and nitrous foam they found, they mingled and with subtlest art concocted and adjusted, they reduced to, into blackest grain and into store conveyed. How is, how is satanic alchemy different than angelic alchemy? What a great question. Yeah. It, it, um... Wait, wait, you know what? I need to not, another glass of cold water and I'll be back, okay? What, what line did we start at just now? 510, I think. 510, okay. 510. Did they already have nitrate oxide at this point? Okay, so what is the difference between angelic eye digestion and satanic eye digestion? So we saw before that angels, Raphael is teaching men how we can go up. Right. So here it devolves. So from in the angelic, we go from the physical to the spiritual. What happens here? So they go to the originals of nature. I guess that's the elements of the earth in their crude conception. Sulfurous and nitrous foam they found. They mingled them with subtle art. Right there's the alchemical um, um, tip off. And when when he's talking about al alchemy, he's also talking about poetry and art. They found they mingled and with subtlest art, when uses the term, concocted and adjusted, they were in, and, and they reduced to blackest grain and into store conveyed. The concoction of angels or of men by when they aspire from, in, from corporeal to incorporeal, the alchemical process leads to that alchemical aim of um, what were the other concocting of transubstantiation, 
What what do the devils do with their art? It deb debases it, it like corrupts it. Well, that's already a metaphor, but I mean, just come, they they take the they take the physical and they make it even more physical. They take these these crude they take celestial soil, concoct and a dust, and they reduce it to blackest grain, in, and into store conveyed. Um, you know, remember, or also, do you remember in book four when Ethereal comes to the frog? And there's another metaphor of, of Ethereal lighting up. Remember that? And he is imagined as this, he's imagined, I think, as gunpowder, which is stored. So Milton here is helping us understand the metaphor in book four. The Ethereal is able to look at that. What is Ethereal, the angel, able to do with this satanic contraction of the physical. Ethereal in book four, remember that scene? Oh, we did, only some of us did it together. Um, and we did that at the end of the class. Um, I'll just look at it quickly. Do you remember where it was? Fit to the ton, right? Ton, right? Or is it ton, T-O-N or T-U-N? Here we go. Um, here's Ethereal. He's coming up to remember Eve. Uh, the, uh, Satan is 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 kneeling at Eve's ear, and he's like a frog, and it, and and Ethereal touches him, and he turns back into himself. As when a spark lights on the heap of nitrous power, powder laid fit for the ton, some magazine to store against a womb of war. Right? You see the way in which Milton is using the metaphor in Book Five to help us understand the metaphor in Book Six this purely physical thing that Satan represents, what can the angel do? He can convert it from the physical into the spiritual. What does the devil do? He takes the physical and makes it more physical. But the devil is also spiritual. Right, but his, so there, so maybe, so maybe just like in, just like in Spencer's Fairy Queen, there are different kind of artists. So in Milton, there are different kind of artists. And Milton and Satan here is being understood as a kind of artist, that his artistry leads towards the physical. It's very Spencerian, really, because the bad, bad poets in Spencer end in the physical. So Satan is, becomes a very, is a very similar character. In Spencer, you move from the physical to the allegorical. I mean, in Spencer's obviously much more dualistic than Milton. Here, there's this upward movement through the physical. And it's through the sensual that you um, that you um, become more spiritual, which is weird, right? Here's just as a gloss on this on what we just said. Through the sensual, you become more spiritual. I'm gonna I'm gonna help you in one second. Okay, it's gonna get better. Okay, so here Milton writes in an oopsie. Er uh, Milton writes in one of his early works, sorry, Dartmouth, Milton of Education. You can see it now? Yeah? You see of education? People? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Milton says here, He's talking about the curriculum for students. And he goes through, I think, a bunch of philosophers on the, oh, he goes through, I don't know, math, I don't know what he goes through first, but he lists a whole different things. And then he goes, or he starts with philosophy and then rhetoric. Demosthenes, Cicero, Plato, Plato, Aristotle, Cicero, again, Longinus, to which poetry would be made subsequent or indeed rather precedent as being less subtle and fine, but more simple, sensuous, and passionate. Now this is written way before Milton writes Paradise Lost, but there is a certain continuity between what he's saying here and the aesthetic of Paradise Lost. So first he says poetry should be subsequent, meaning you learn that after philosophy, but then he really changes it. It's not a question of temporality, but of what's more important. 
or indeed rather precedent, as being less subtle and fine. I mean, that seems to be a bad thing. I mean, you, your philosophers, I guess, are subtle and fine. Um, and Milton is celebrating this, the, 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 the physicality of poetry, as we'll see in a second, or indeed rather precedent as being less subtle and fine, but more simple, sensuous, and passionate. Why does poetry teach better than philosophy? Why is it precedent to philosophy? Here's Milton's own defense of poetry. I mean, Paradise Lost is really Milton's defense of poetry, but in our education, we get one line. It's more connected to, connected to the material. Yeah. It, it sinks in more easily. Like it totally bypasses your reason and just goes straight for your emotion. So you, um, you, yeah, you I mean, I'm, 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 I'm really uh, good. I mean, I, those, that's good. To, but, but how do I'm really more in relationship to not our language of emotion, but the language of book five that we just read. Well, I mean, you're right. To, you're right to say. Sh sh you're, you're right to say what you're saying, um, and you're talking really about aesthetic effect. Um, and I'm asking, I'm asking not about aesthetic effect, but ideas of of what poetry does. I guess that's the same question, but I mean in its mechanisms, not, not what its effect I mean, does, not, not what its effect is. Right, well, the, the rhythm is pleasing. You're, still, you're, you're, asking, you're not asking the question. Not what its effect is, but how it works. How does it work? It employs images instead of ideas. Work? So it, so, Right, so I, I want I'm, what I'm asking again, and we've asked this question many times, is how does Milton the Puritan, how does he make peace with this idea of writing poetry, which are images? And we want to understand if Paradise Lost is a kind of defense of poetry, and I think it is, then what kind of defense is it? How does the language that we're using here, I mean, I think what you're saying is, um, let's just, I, I'm wondering really, what does the image do? It pleases, it has nice rhythms, but how does it, how does it relate things, pop, you know, maybe not un, unlawful to reveal? How does it relate things invisible? How does, according to Milton, it get away with it? It incarnates. No, but see, that's, that's Catholic, right? It doesn't, I mean, you're turning Milton into a, into a pure monist, and he's not. That's, see, that's, see, that's where I think monists are wrong because their idea of represent, Milton's idea of representation is not monist. Milton does not think the word equals the thing. Because if he did think the word equal the thing, he wouldn't give a billion different metaphors. He's always holding up different lenses and saying, um, it's, it's, a, it's almost as if he's holding up um, self-dissolving snapshots of the internal. Well, that's the Did you, whole, that's uh, the I, I really like that metaphor, and it's not simple. Did everybody hear that? Self-dissolving snapshots of the eternal. You know what I mean by that? I mean, it's not elegant. I'm not claiming that. But I think in that way, that's what Milton's Im images do. They give you an image of the eternal, and then they back away from it, right? Yet never saw, whatever. So that's in, that, is not, that is not incarnate. That is not, that is not believing that representation for Milton just seems to point to something. It's, it gives, he, he gives, um, how do you say this? Through the, the multiplicity of, like the, using many metaphors means that you, he can hint at the truth through mud, multiple metaphors and through finding the common thread within the metaphors, you see what he's trying to say. It's a way well, of- I, Okay, I like, what you're, I, I like what you're saying. A common thread is gonna take a lot of work. I mean, the question is, Reading tick, a lot of well, well, no, but tick, uh, I, I think it's an impossible task. I mean, I think, I, I think that Milton uses many different metaphoric registers. I mean, I like what you're saying about difference, that Milton gives us many lenses and they're all distinct and different. And I think from some point of view in Milton's imagination, they're different, but all indispensable. But then my question again is, how does he get away with it? Meaning, how do you know? And maybe part of the monism that Milton is talking about 
may, you know, that last, that what if clause. What if the world is really more like heaven than we think it is? That's the hint of optimism that lets him write. Maybe these images are similar in their multiple or represent all of them in their, in their multiplicity. Each one of them shows some similarity to the divine. I mean, I, I think there, you know, the way I was reading up until now was that Milton is like, uses the images and throws them away. And basically all you're, do, all you're left with is you're pointing to something you know is not there. That's Milton as a kind of net negative theologian. And now I'm kind of thinking it a little bit differently. You know what I mean by that? Milton is a negative theologian. I know God what he, by what he's not, meaning look at this, he's not that, look at this, he's not that, look at this, he's not that. And that way he would, he would fun, Milton would function in the same way that the Bible does for Maimonides, right? Um, and I don't know if that's, I think, I think Milton's, because of Milton's monism, and Maimonides is definitely not a monist, because of Milton's monism, um, there is that confidence that representation may be close to, it may through reason, through discourse, through the, you know, it's it, right reason is not only in the, is not only when a, when a poet is reasonable, right? Reason is also when a poet is poetic. And if a poet chooses a reasonable metaphor and is not inspired, but when his reason is like in touch with the divine, then he's going to come up with metaphors that somehow will partake in some, partake is a bad word, it represents incarnation. It will in some way represent the divine. Um, and I think he's confirming the defense of poetry of Sydney. Yeah. What's a, is that a question or a statement? No, I, that's why, what I think. That he's doing yeah. what? That he's doing what? He's confirming the what Sidney say about Sidney says about the defense of poetry that mm. I can't remember exactly the the phrase now, but that um, if you can tell, I remember the idea, but not the sentence. Oh, oh maybe a, spe a speaking picture, a speaking picture, right? I mean, but but Milton's Milton is simultaneously has much more confidence chutzpah than Sidney does, and much more anxiety at the same time because Milton Milton's idea of the imagination is very different from Sidney's. Milton's idea of the imagination is almost is an inspired idea of the imagination, and he and um, for Milton that idea. I mean, we didn't. We should also for Milton, as I said before, right reason is that thing that mediates between the spiritual and the physical, not the pineal gland as it is for Descartes but reason and part of right reason is the image making function. And I think Milton feels that if people are using their reason, you know, all sorts of assumptions here in the way that God intends them to use it, then not only will the metaphors that he writes make sense, but they'll also be understood. And then, you know, Paradise Lost is part of the history of Milton's disappointment that people misunderstand him. And because, and because they misunderstand him, it shows to him that they're not using their right reason. So what we're saying, and he gives any, any, and he gives in an inkling that maybe, uh oh, Hobbes might be right. Go ahead. I mean, I don't know. He never thinks that, but that's always possible. <laughs> but maybe there really is no, nothing that brings. Maybe there really is nothing that guarantees the possibility of of communication. Because so with, because without right reason, because with right, outright reason, there is really no guarantee. Let, I mean, if your starting point is Hobbes, Hobbes basically says. We'd love to have communication, but we can't have communication because people have private languages and they are in conflict with one another and they will kill each other. So we have, so the sovereign not only, can, um, he not only um, is, is a ruler over political entities, but he also rules over language. There's one language and everybody has to agree to its meetings and that's what the sovereign does because we can't trust people to interpret because they'll kill each other. Milton says, no, not so fast, but there's this thing called right reason. And because of right reason, representation and interpret both representation and interpretation become possible. It's really what he's saying. Um, and when it fails, <laughs> he bums out because he, he, he I, I don't think he ever has the inkling that Hobbes is right, but he realizes the, the world in which he lives is always on the brink 
okay. of total lack of communication. Kind of like ours. Right. Right. Yeah, I, I'm, I'll be out in about 10 minutes, girls. <laughs> Hold on one second. Somebody told me, told me. Yeah. Well, what did he say? What was the last thing he said? I just, I didn't pay attention. Um, he talked about Milton's anxiety that, about communication not being possible. And about the difference between Hobbes and... Uh, Hey guys, sorry about that. So many different people in my house right now. The difference between Hobbes and Milton. Um, right. No, so Hobbes really doesn't, Hobbes is, I, I just realized how grim, how grim the vision of Hobbes' world is. It's a world without, it's a world without communication. It's a world of communication not possible. It's an Orwellian word, world, really. There's just me word. I mean, it, it, it leads to, it can lead to an Orwellian word. I Meaning the authority just decides what things mean. You don't agree tough. I'll hit you over the head with a baseball bat. And, and, and Milton says, Milton's way of salvaging community is through reason. That it's divinely ordained. Locke's way of salvaging to community is through property interest. Meaning, Hobbes says we're only we can only, we need to put somebody in charge because otherwise we'll kill each other, and Locke says well we have to join together because we all have a mutual interest in protecting our private property, and that will give us common interests and those common interests will make us put that will determine a certain kind of society that we can live in, which happens to be the tolerant society that we live in today, I think I think all those things are related. Um, but I think you see with Milton that communication between man and man and man and God is it, both of them are guaranteed by reason. And part of reason and reason is not only re, the imaginative enterprise is also reasonable. And because of that, the um, right reason of man, I think gives Milton confidence that his representations might be right and might be understood. I think Milton in book five just shows how difficult it is to both write and to be interpreted. He does not assume that interpretation is, that, that communication is easy. It's very hard. So Milton, Milton trusts the reasons of his audience? Well, see, right reason, in a way, um, right reason is a kind of Christian enlightenment, meaning enlightenment will say man is born inherently reasonable, right? And people will act reasonably if they just follow their intelligence as humans. They will act reasonably because that is the human project, to be a reasonable person. I mean, that myth died pretty hard, right? in the 20th century. But um, Milton's is um, that reason, it's a Christian enlightenment, that if you use your reason in a certain way, that you're, you, you are tuned into the divine, then there'll be a possibility of understanding and communication. It's, but it's, enlight it's, it, it's enlightenment, but it requires that seed of the divine. Let me just let me look at one quotation from Ari Pajitoko, which is kind of relevant. Yeah. Well. About the about the metaphor. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I couldn't quite figure out how to word this. Um, so what we're saying is Maimonides does that, mm. right? He kind of draws the black around the shape, mm. and then Milton does that. He outlines the shape by drawing lines inside it. So you get the idea of the shape, but you don't see the, all the outline. Um. Okay, I mean, I'm not, I'm not so happy with the outline, but okay. Let me just, I just want to look at this, um, but I think what, here we go. 
here we go. This is really interesting, we'll end with this. Um, so here Milton is making this absolutely, uh, uh, he's making an, a hyper hyperbolic argument about books. Here he goes. And yet, on the other hand, unless wariness be used, as good almost kill a man as kill a good book. That's the hyperbole, right? Who kills a man, it kills a reasonable creature, God's image. But he who destroys a good book kills reason itself, kills the image of God, as it were, in the eye. Right? It's an extraordinary metaphor that Milton is using in order to argue for almost he's giving a lifeblood to books. I'm not so interested in that now. But here, who kills a man kills a reasonable creature, God's image, but he who destroys a good book kills reason itself, kills the image of God. Meaning, so the, God, image, the image, of, the image yeah. of God in man is, 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 is his reason. Is his reason, right. And, and for Milton as well, reason is not separate. The poet is reasonable, and he provides reasonable images. What makes them reasonable? That they, maybe earth is closer to heaven than we imagine it to be. Maybe I'm right. That, that the image uh, matches the idea, right? That that, image, this is what yeah. makes it reasonable. That the interpretation and the representation come together. Right, I, although I think for Milton, there's always that they come together, but just for an instant. Yeah, there's that vanishing, dissolving quality. But they are faithful. I mean, I know it's hard to say, but the images are reasonable because they are part partially faithful. Right. So again, that's, and here's our friend, um, you know, Francis Bacon, you know, aphorism 55 of similar similarity and difference. And that's what Milton talks about when he talks about the mind of, the, the intuitive versus discursive mind of man. The discursive mind of man as opposed to the angels, its difference is built in. But there's also, because of the whole monism, there's the possibility of similarity. That good poetry in a way raises people up. It raises, almost good poetry raises itself up or brings the incorporeal to the corporeal. I'm not sure how it works here. Can I go back to something you said earlier, Professor? Okay, okay. Um, I'm thinking again about the- Wow, it's really late, it was really late, but so, so yeah, this is a great class. Anybody who wants to stay, you can stay, Alan. I'm happy to answer questions in another 10 minutes, but I just don't wanna, I don't wanna keep people later than already. Okay, so, so great to see you, you're the best. Thank you. And I'll see you soon. Bye. Yeah, go ahead, Alana. So I was going to ask that, like the whole, this whole lesson started with why did the angels eat? Yeah. And so the way that whole scene of the angel and the preparing of the food and the angel giving this whole explanation about how if God gives the food, then I'm going to eat it and I'm going to make it into the incorporeal. Mm -hmm. That whole image is, in, is like a metaphor of, on the other hand, the poet taking the spiritual and making it into something we can digest. It's a metaphor, but it's also a consequence. Meaning because the world is this way in such a way that angels eat, poets can write poetry because there's a continuity between the spiritual, because there is a continuity between what poets write and what they're writing about. I'm backing off of, I'm, I, I now erase my Maimonidean thing. My, my, it doesn't apply to Milton. Because Milton does have a confidence that's, that the images will be good enough. They're all, they're all good enough, and they're all indispensable, but n none of them are enough. I mean, the images are, I mean, the images are good. They're good. Are they enough? No, they're not enough. But, the, but what's built into the idea that images are good is, I can hypothesize a relationship by, I can say, I can, I, I can, I can say that, yeah, you can move from the physical to the spiritual. I said to Alana's question, it's both a metaphor and a consequence. Because you can move from the spiritual and the physical, you see angels do that, right? They eat. 
so also people, when they read poetry, can go from the physical to the spiritual. Uh-huh, okay. Because this detail of the angel eating, it doesn't come from anything. It's from his imagination, no. Or am I wrong? Is there any tradition of angels eating? Only in, only in Genesis, which, all, in which, Genesis. Most, which most conventional theologians try to do away with. They don't like it. Because that's when the angels come to Abraham and he feeds them, right? Right. So, you know, angels don't eat. They're, angels are purely spiritual. They don't eat. They don't need to eat. Uh -huh. There is no connection between spiritual and physical. Professor, can you re reiterate what you said about the images are good but not enough? Meaning, I think the image, Milton never erases the images completely. They always linger. They're always there. Meaning you, you always remember the last one as you're starting to look at a new one. I mean, you never start with zero. You've always got these lenses and they're competing with one another in your brain. And, and maybe God is in the leftover. Well, I don't know. I mean, God is not only in the leftover, God is in all of them. Okay, I'm gonna I go. I, I, think, I think I'm the only one without air conditioning. So I'm gonna go and drink water and I'll write you, I'll speak to you guys later. Anybody, I'll be around tomorrow for office hours. If you want, I'll send, I'll send a link out, okay? Right, Can you send you us the link to Professor Kramer's um, oh, right, at eight, party? Right, at eight, at eight o'clock there's that party, right. right. Can you send us the link to the Zoom link? I'll do it right, yeah, I'll do it right now. It's on Thank Facebook, you. wait, it's on the Facebook page. Just go to the department But it's page. not, it's, it's a picture. It's not as like a link. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll you cannot. You. So. Okay, I'll send you the link. Sure. Thanks. Okay. Speak to you soon. Bye. Bye. Bye, Bye. Dana, maybe the picture can suffice. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Very good. Yeah. Excellent. Vitor.